has been good. God has been good. And we thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it has been a pleasant week. The week has run so fast. Monday, we had a beautiful time with the Lord. When we were tackling a beautiful topic, God and my type of family. And on Tuesday, another beautiful topic, single and thriving to have a word of prayer. The Chesda church elder, Biwam Chonchi, she's going to be the one leading us in prayer. Elder Mchonchi, can you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you very much, uh, Elder Biga. Let us uh, close our eyes as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for another beautiful day. As we have just uh, begun a new day, we want to thank you, Lord, for, for being with us. And we want to thank you, Lord, for the beautiful messages that we have received this week. As we were challenged, Lord, to first appreciate where you have put us or the kinds of families that we are in. We want to thank you, Lord, even for the days following for the other messages. In a very special way, Lord, it is my prayer, Lord, that we may continue to follow you in our different stations in life and embrace this life that you have given to us so that we may live abundantly. In a very special way, Lord, we pray for our speaker for today again, Pastor Lupondwana and his family. It is my prayer, Lord, that our hearts are ready to receive. And all of the participants, all of us who are listening today, we are praying, Lord, that we are changed as a result of this. We don't just get impressed because of the beautiful uh, message we're receiving, but we repent. It's my prayer, Lord, that you bless the people uh, listening today and those who are going to listen in the future, for we know, Lord, that this is going to be a permanent record. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ndala. Thank you for, for the prayer. Yesterday, due to some technical glitches, we did not have a special item of music. But friends, let me assure you today that we are ready. And uh, the Kunene family, Gugu and Linda Lani, are ready to bless us with a beautiful and powerful item of music. Over to you, the Kunenes. And immediately after the kunenes, the next voice that you will hear is that of Umkundis Ulkondan. Umkundis Ulkondan, please, immediately after this presentation, you are welcome once again. You have been a blessing to all of us. Immediately after the presentation, you take over. You don't need an introduction now. Over to you. for Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, would rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. Hear our for hope when my heart have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost away. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, hearts 
has always hunger for. Oh, mighty infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, here in the weakness you find us, calling before your throne. Oh, we falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You can the healing and Let me greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. I hope that we are going to have a wonderful time together this evening as we have in the previous um, evenings. <clears throat> I would just want to highlight one thing that uh, Elder Mbinga mentioned, that our topic for today is blended families. We rearrange the topics there was a request that we do blended families at the end on um, Saturday evening. So that's what we are going to do. And um, I think we have lost our... And today we had, our topic is the dynamics of marriage. Let's see if I cannot succeed in doing this. Um, we are going through our old age problem again. Let's try. Yes, I think uh, we may have arrived at our destination. Today we are dealing with the dynamics of, of marriage and um, the, the, the dynamics we are going to be dealing with before we, we get into the dynamics themselves, it is important for us to remember that um, God is the one who created marriage. He's the one who created it. But there are certain things that God did not outline about marriage. First of all, one of the things he did not stipulate in scripture is why people should get into the marriage. He told us what the marriage can do. The marriage, um, the, the, the idea of the marriage, people being married, coming together, being fruitful and multiply, filling the earth and subduing it. That's what they were going to do as human beings. But some of the things that were not mentioned was why people should get married. Um, <clears throat> as a result, we, we have a number of reasons why people get married. For some people, it was a childhood dream. They always wanted to get married. In fact, I think uh, the people who generally fall in this category are the wives, the brides on the wedding day. They, they, they've always had this idea of a marriage. In fact, I discovered that they even have 
a, a picture of a wedding. They have an idea of the wedding. They have a picture of the groom. They have a picture of a lot of things. It's just that the groom in their mind, in the dream, does not have a face. And so when you come along, they just take your face and attach it to the dream that's already there. So the dream has already been, there's always been there. The dress has always been there. Everything. I remember speaking to one young lady um, who, who said that she is just a, a groom away from getting married. Otherwise, everything else is sorted. She knows where she wants to get married. She knows she already has the venue. She already has the decor. She already has the outfit he is going to wear. She just needs him to rock up and be willing. That's all that she needs. And so for some people, this is a childhood dream. They've always wanted to get married. They've always wanted to have a, a husband. They've always wanted to have a wife. They've always looked forward to having a family. This is the picture they've had since childhood. So they get married because they've always wanted to get married. They, that's it. They've always wanted to get married. And, and now it is happening. For some other people, they get married because they want legal sex. Uh, especially people who, 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 who are spirit, uh, communities of faith. You know that the Lord does not condone you just go around having sex. So you feel you want to have sex legally, you know, in a legit way, in a way that is respectable, in a way that's going to make you be at peace with yourself and God and the world around you. And that's what uh, uh, is, is a primary reason. All the other things can come along, but this, this, was, this was the main thing. For some people, they get married because this is the best way they feel they can parent their children. They believe that to come up with a home uh, where you can raise children and raise them uh, in, in a godly manner, it's the best shot you can give for children. does not mean that if they are not in a home where there's a husband and wife, they're not going to turn out well. It simply means that the person believes that the best shot you can give your children is to put them in a home where the two are married and the children grow up in a, in a, in a home like that. That is, uh, that is one of the reasons why people get married. Others fall in love. Others fall in love. And sometimes you find that people who say that I'm not, I'm not the marrying type, I'm not interested in marriage, I don't want to get into those things. Boom, one day they fall in love and next thing they're sending you wedding invitations. Now you must budget to attend their funerals. Why? Because they're in love. They're in love. They met somebody and they felt, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And that's one of the reasons why uh, people decide to get married. Others want companionship. The love thing will come along. They, it'll come along and it's, 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 it's fine if it's there or if it's not there. They just want someone they can share their lives with. Someone they can talk to at the end of the day. Someone to do stuff with. Someone to go places with. They want a companion. They want someone they can, they can, uh, they can grow old with. Uh, someone who's, who they can shuffle their slippers later, with, later on in life with. They want someone they can travel the world with and see the world with. So, so they basically want a partner in life. That's, that's it. That's what they want. Others, they want status. Being married comes with a status. I remember someone says, I do not want to die before I become Mrs. Right. They want the status. And, and in some of our cultures, we, we consider men to not be fully, 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 fully developed if, if, if they are not married yet. As a result, when we are discussing certain things, even though they may be older than us, they are not involved in certain discussions because they said, we simply say, I suga, I suga, elo. and it's as if the person has less to offer because they are not married. And so sometimes marriage offers a status. It offers a certain status even in church. And funny enough, in our culture, uh, you'll find that we, we tend to give respect to, to, to a married woman who's 25 than to a single person who's 40. And it doesn't really make sense because we are big on, we are, we are big on age, but, but that's what seems to happen. There's certain status that comes with being married, not just in the community, sometimes in church. Sometimes it's just that you feel that, uh, you know, you've always wanted to, to have the title. And so, and, so, and so you have it. And sometimes people get married because it makes financial sense. I mean, this is upward mobility of financially. You're marrying someone and you figure out if I marry, with this, if I marry this person, my life's going to turn out well. I'll probably be uh, taken care of. I'll be able to afford a lifestyle uh, that I can't afford currently. And so people marry. They marry because they want a better life. They want a better quality of life. And they feel that the person they are marrying may be able to deliver that quality of life. In the past, this was largely something that was... Um, 
a stereotype for women. We, they were the ones who were said to marry for, for money. Huh? Uh, things have changed. Now everybody marries for money. Men marry for money. I mean, everybody wants to marry well at some point. And then they feel that, okay, fine. It just that depends what the well is. For some people, that well is financial. And so today we even have guys who feel, well, okay, I think if I marry her, she'll be able to afford the lifestyle that I want. So some people marry for money. Other people, it's peer pressure. Everybody around them is getting married and they feel, well, why not? Why not get married? I mean, it can't be that bad. I mean, everybody's getting married. Everyone is having a shower. Everyone is getting a wedding. Everyone is having babies. Everyone is raising children. People are attending couples retreats. So they want to get married. There are many reasons why people, to get, why people get married. And the, one of the interesting things is that we don't quite have a wrong reason. We have reasons that we do not hold um, in high regard true. But we don't really have a wrong reason to get married. Well, unless you're trying to kill the person, well, that would be a wrong one. But generally, we, we don't have a wrong reason. You can't say someone who married for money, married for the wrong reasons. There's no right reason. Um, because in the past, we've done this. It's just what we've put it in a nice way. We've said, you marry someone who's going to provide. No, it's basically money. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we can't even say that uh, you can't marry for peer pressure. Well, parents have been doing it all the time. They'll tell you, people your age are getting married. And then somehow that's supposed to be a, a, a something that um, spurs you on. So we've had different reasons why people get married. And, 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 and there's no right necessary, there's no right reason or reason that's holier than the other reason. But this is the interesting thing. Sometimes when two people get married and their reasons are not synchronized or they are not aware of each other's reasons, the, the, their expectations will be different and they will not be able to meet each other's expectations because the, the other one was not into this for the same reasons that you are in. For example, let's assume someone, so one of you marries for money and the other one marries because um, this, 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 this is, they, they, they want to fall in love. All right, so two people, one for money, one for love. One has fallen in love. And the one who's fallen in love is expect you guys to have this romantic marriage where you are doing things together. You go to church together. And probably sometimes you might even have some matching outfits where you talk, you know, you spend time connecting, you read books about marriage, you go to retreats together, you try and uh, have dinner, date nights together you are doing things together you're just supposed to be a couple in love so this one is really looking for that looking forward to that that's their vision that's their dream that's what they want to see because they feel i love you you love me this is going to be a wonderful journey together and you feel i think you should be working a lot because um, i'm into this for money now the problem is this you are not interested in having this money blown on, on date nights and those things. You, you want to have the money. There's a certain quality that you want. I mean, you want certain clothes. You want certain uh, brand names of bags and shoes or even cars, if depending if you could be a guy or, or suits. And so you find that this person's concept of love is just slowing you down. You're not interested in all these other things because this is not why you got in here. And so sometimes you can, it, it can appear as though there is a conflict there is uh, different views of marriage, different conceptions of marriage. Well, true, because you did not get in for the same reason. You did not hear for the same for the same reason. You both are married there. Yeah. And it's true that you may love each other, but that's not your primary concern. Somebody else may want companionship. You just want someone to spend your life with. And the other one is busy asking you, do you love me? You're like, but what does that have to do with anything? I'm ma I married you, didn't I? And you're like, huh? So in other words, you're in this marriage and you don't even love me. That one is like, it doesn't matter. I'm not going anywhere because this one wanted companionship. So they, they don't really prioritize the fact that, well, I love you. You don't love me. That's immaterial. I'm here because I want to be with you. I want us to share our lives together. And the other one feels unloved and you find them having a problem. How do you survive a marriage where there is no love? Well, you have the love. The other one is into this for companionship. Sometimes you marry someone who just wants to raise kids well. Um, and you feel that this person wants to, you to be a good family that raised children well. And the other person is here because their peers were getting married. Now you are in this thing, you're trying to come up with a marriage that wants kids and the other one's like, really? Oh, Lord, you know, just let's just do it. If you want to do it, you do it. Don't really involve me in all the other nitty gritties. I got into this thing because others were in it. Now you want me to put effort. That's a completely different thing because this one got married because other people are getting married. Now they are in and it's like, yo, 
they may not necessarily be into the effort. They might, they might really not be into the effort. And so it's important that when, when two people are married, they, they discuss it. Now, it's important that when you discuss it, you start by understanding that there is no holier reason. Of course, you can say, well, maybe love is a holy reason. Well, not, not really. For, for generations, people married and it had nothing to do with love. I mean, Isaac did not even meet Rebecca. He met Rebecca when she was already engaged to him. Uh, Eliezer went and negotiated, paid Lobola, brought her back. Isaac saw her and was told, by the way, this is Rebecca. Who is she? She's your wife. Oh, yes, Rebecca, this is Isaac, your husband. Nice, nice to meet you. That was it. There was no love there in that story, but people got married. So the, I, because the Bible has never prescribed that you get into the marriage for love, you can't require that the person may have wanted to marry you because of love. What the Bible does say is that once you are in, then God commands this one to submit and the other one to love. That's what happens when you're in. But coming in, it doesn't prescribe what reasons you're going to have. It's just that the Holy Spirit is going to give you a, a way of making sure this marriage succeeds. Now, when you're going to have this discussion about, look, what is your primary thing in this marriage? Uh, of course, you may be tempted to, to, you may expect that the other one is going to say love. And, and, if, and if you're the kind of person who's going to make a big deal about the fact that the person did not say they love you, you got, you're going to end up being given a reason that's going to suit you. And that reason may not always synchronize with what's going on in the marriage. Um, you, you may always wonder that, why, why is it that so-and-so doesn't do this? If you love me, you should be doing this. You're assuming that the person got into this for that reason. So, so if you're going to have the conversation, what's your primary thing? What's, what's, what's your main thing in the marriage? When you have that discussion, the other person is going to say, well, for me, I've always wanted to have a family. Okay, then you know here yeah, that whole, you can now understand why the whole romantic thing is not necessarily into this person's thing. Always wanted to have a marriage, always wanted to be married. I mean, my parents were married, my grandparents were married. In my family, we get married, we raise kids. This is what we do. So you know that this is something that's moving from generation to generation. It's not an evil reason. It's not a bad reason. This is this person's reason. This was his thinking when they got in here. Does it mean the person doesn't love you? Yes, the person does love you, hopefully. But that's the reason they came in with. You share your reason. Why? Because I love you. I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you. Good. That's your reason. It's not holier than the other one. It's not more noble than the other one. That's your reason. Now, as you do this, as, as you share your reasons, you will then be able to understand why certain things are important to the other person and why others are not important to the other person. You'll understand. You'll understand why certain things to him or to her are a big deal and other things are not, which you thought would have been a big deal. You, If some Someone says, I married because I always wanted to be married. I always wanted the status of being married. I always wanted to be Mrs. Someone, or I always wanted to be somebody's husband. If that's the person's concern, then you can understand why it's important for them to always project the whole proper Mrs. or Mr. thing. It's important for them because that's their primary. You may be there saying, but why is it important that other people see you like this? That other people, why are you trying to impress people? Well, the status, status is always about other people. It's, 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 what, it's what other people see when they look at you. That's what it's about. So you may be saying, but it does not make sense why you would uh, prioritize other people, other people's views. If the person married for status, we now have to factor into, okay, fine. Because of this, it's important. Now you understand why it's important for the person to look a particular way. Now, I'm not saying that this, this is necessarily wrong because I, I want us to move from that departure. We are not talking about a right or wrong reason. We are simply saying, this is your reason. Because this is your reason, then I can understand certain things and probably make allowances for other things. We can sit and discuss how we can approach and how we can meet certain needs. Now, when, when we are growing up, there, there are times when there, 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 there are people who, to whom we were non-entities. There are people to whom we were not significant who probably looked down on us. And we would like to have those people see us succeed in life. Now, when we have that need to, to, to be seen, to, have, to be better than what we were, to, to be better off than what we were, sometimes that need is you have it because as a kid, there are certain people, and some of us even have names of those people. We have names of people we wish they could know we are doing well. Now, because you have that need that you have grown up with, sometimes we get married for those people to know that I am doing well, for those people to know that I am having a great life, for those people to know that I am happily married. And sometimes that need is satisfied by us 
posting a completely different life on social media than the one that we have. Some people need to see. We need to dress in a particular way. Whether or not we can afford it or not is different because we are trying to become significant to those people. And unfortunately, you can never be really satisfy it. It's going to need some form of therapy or for you to just acknowledge that it's a need that you have and it may not necessarily be satisfied. But when you have that, you'll find that the marriage here is serving a different goal from the other one who's madly in love, who's who feels that they have a partner in crime for the rest of their life. No, for you, this is part of your achievement in life. And there are certain people who need to know that you have achieved. And there are certain people who need to be constantly aware that you are married and this is what your life is like. These are reasons that people have that bring them into marriage. And it's important to know the reasons. When you know the reasons, we are able to handle one another. We are able to build a life together. Now, when, when people do get married, there, there are risks that come with getting married. And I'm just going to mention two today, and then, we are going to be, then we'll be able to move on. The first risk is that two sinners marry. First risk uh, in any marriage, two sinners marry. And then there's a photograph of myself and my wife. We were very young at that stage. And I remember when my son saw the photograph, he asked me, Daddy, why was that at your wedding? I said, yes. He says, you were not wearing shoes in church. I'm like, no, I was not wearing shoes in church. I was barefooted with my stick because um, that's, 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 that, that was a reflection of my culture. And my wife was wearing a white wedding dress, a reflection of hers. Now, when two sinners get married, because when we got married, it was two sinners getting married. Now, this is a risk that every couple runs when they get married. One. Since you are marrying a sinner and you yourself are a sinner, you run a risk that at the end of the day, you may end up being a worse sinner than you were before you met this person. Before you got married, you were a sinner, but you can end up being a worse sinner than you were before. You could end up being more evil and more vindictive than you were before. You may end up being a person that you can't even recognize because you married a sinner and you yourself are a sinner. So when the sinner acts in a particular way, your reaction is the reaction of a sinner. With it, that we may end up being better people or we may end up being worse people. And, and, and for some people, for some people, marriage has become a nightmare. It has. Also because when, 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 when they got into the marriage, they did not expect the other sinner to, to really be a sinner to them. Even when we, when we get married and we do in, 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 in good times and bad times, we don't expect the bad times to come from the spouse. We expect the bad times to come from outside to us and the two of us at facing the bad times. You don't expect the bad times to start here. You're like, good times and bad times. I did not expect this. For I expected your sickness and my health. Okay, maybe maybe my sickness and your health will be together. In sickness and in health, yes. You know, for richer or poorer, yes. And the rich the poor must be must be because of COVID-19, you know, must be because of a pandemic, because of a problem, not because you squandered the money. It, it, must, it, must, it must be a threat that comes from outside. And, and the moment you are the cause of the problem, it's a different story altogether. And then you're like, no. And then your reaction is different. You don't expect that your tears are going to come from the spout, spouse, that your heartache is going to come from the spouse. You don't expect that your misery, your troubles, your lack of sleep at night is going to come from the spouse. You don't expect that this is the person who's going to cause you to be diagnosed with hypertension. You don't. You don't expect them to cause you ulcers. You don't expect them to cause you a stroke and depression. You don't expect your spouse to be the one who, who makes you wonder, hmm, where can I get somebody to kill this one and make it look like an accident? You don't expect that from your spouse. You expect that problems are going to come from outside and the two of you are going to deal with them. And sometimes when you discover that the sinner that you have married is really a sinner and your reaction is like, I go, oh, you can't do that to me and you give them a response that is equal to what they have done as you match each other's evil as you match each other's sinfulness to try and fight to show the other one that two can play that game you can end up being a worse sinner than you were when you were single 
That's a risk you play, you're, you're, the risk you run when you get married. Or marriage can bring both of you close to God. It can make both of you realize that you need the Lord and you search him and you get him to, to, to give you guidance. You follow the guidance as much as possible and you discover that marriage is one of those relationships in life that test your, your, your faith every day. They it's marriage and parenting. They test your faith every day because you can't get time off. You're always married. You're always a parent. It constantly seek him and ask him to forgive you, and you start over. And because you're married to a sinner, if you are, if this thing is, if you're going to end up closer to the Lord, you are going to need to work on forgiveness because you're married to a sinner, which means the sinner is going to sin constantly, consistently. And even when they have good intentions not to sin, do you know what Paul says? He says, that which I want to do, I do not do. And that which I do not want to do, that's what I find myself doing. That's what Paul is talking about. And guess what? Sometimes the people we are married to, you tell them, you must do this and say, but I wanted to do it. And guess what they've done? They've done the things they did not want to do. And the things they wanted to do, that's what the stuff they did not do. And you look at them, you're like, whoa. And they ask for forgiveness. They ask for forgiveness. And if things are going to work, we forgive. And sometimes we wonder, really, Lord, how many times? And sometimes we're able to say, Lord, I've done the 70 times seven. I'm at 491 now. So I think we are sorted. Now I can afford to do this. We, 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 we are going to spend the rest of our lives with someone who is a sinner, someone who, who has fallen short of the glory of God. And unfortunately, it's part of their DNA. The sinning thing is part of the DNA. Sometimes they, they don't even need to come up with, with grand ideas of how they're going to do it. No, sometimes they just do it and they find themselves having done it. And we forgive, we seek to be better. Now, the risk that every couple runs of either turning out being a worse sinner than you were before or being closer to what God intended is a risk that we all run. And it's you choose, you have a capacity to choose how you want to end up. And, and I want to say, because of the different challenges that we, we face in marriage, we don't usually say this enough, but I'd like us to mention it. Marriage is holy. Your salvation is holier. Marriage is a wonderful thing, but your salvation is even better. We would rather that you be in the kingdom and having had a marriage that did not work than for you to have survived and tried to live through a marriage and miss out on eternity. I say this because the church's primary business is salvation. And that's where, that's where our concern is. And so we, we, we would rather, if, if push comes to shove, we would rather you prioritize your faith. We would rather you prioritize your relationship with the Lord, even, even above your spouse and above your marriage. God always comes first and your salvation is primary. The first risk we run is that you have two sinners who are marrying. And because these two sinners are marrying, one may end up, you, you run the risk of either turning out to be worse, a worse sinner than you were or much better than you were before. The second risk we run is that in the quest of becoming one, of the two becoming one, you run the risk where one of you will be dissolved into the other and there'll only be one person left. There'll only be one person doing the thinking and the other one simply implements. There'll only be one person whose dreams are being fulfilled. The other one is simply playing a supportive role to the fulfillment of that dream. There'll only be one person whose feelings have to be attended to. The other one has to do their attending to the feeling. There is only one person who will be entitled to be angry and to act this way. And the other one, the other one should be understanding. Unfortunately, when two are trying to become one, we have seen instances where the other one's brain seems to be packed in the cupboard or in the fridge somewhere. It's waiting for, I don't know, maybe for Jesus to come again. And only one person does the thinking here. Only one person has ideas of what should happen. Only one person gets to decide what's going to happen next. And sometimes this happens in the quest of the two becoming one. Or if that does not happen, you'll find a situation where you intentionally, intentionally choose to be one unit made up of two people. 
which means you choose to remain two people and in fact cultivate the idea that you should both have, you should maintain having two ideas. When you have a discussion, the other one must be free to express an opinion. If the other one is going to be attacked or belittled and ridiculed for having an opinion, then one of these days, that one who's being belittled is going to dissolve and let you be the only brain in the marriage. And then that way of becoming one is not the way in which Christ has called us to become one. That's not how we become one with him. He, he, in fact, this is how he relates to us. He says, come, let us reason together. Now, if God can say to us, come, let us reason together, don't you think it is only reasonable that when we are married to our spouses, we can also say, come, let us reason together. Come, let us talk. What do you think? This is what I think. And when we think we don't attack the person's opinion, we don't ridicule, we don't try to win over the person's opinion, we are simply saying, what are you thinking? This is what I think, what are we going to do? If the person says, I have this dream, you don't shut it down and say, well, we can only afford one dream. You pursue that this relationship becomes an opportunity for you to pursue your various dreams so that at the end of it, the other one is able to say, I have developed this through this marriage. This marriage has taken me further. This marriage has made me uh, uh, achieve my dreams. It has made me go to a place I never thought I'd go to before. We are one unit, but as much as we are one unit, we have remained two people. If you are an introvert, the other one is an ext extrovert, you don't have to attack the other person. That's why are you always is talking why 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 you just come to understand that my spouse is the one who after church is going to spend 45 minutes greeting everybody my spouse is a social butterfly moves from this person to that one this person to that one this person to that when they eventually come into the car if you're going to explode and say i've been sitting here waiting and yet you met them as this social butterfly you married them as this social butterfly you are trying to make them to cease to be who they are and simply collapse into to who you are. The other option is for you to simply realize that my spouse is a social butterfly and budget that when we leave church, we are going to have 30 minutes to 45 minutes with my spouse doing the whole butterfly, moving from flower to flower. And when they are done, they are going to come into the car beaming, excited that they had a wonderful time in church. So what are you going to do? You're going to get into the car. You're either going to get yourself something to read. You'll find if you're, if, if you're the kind of person who gets hungry in church quickly, bring yourself a lunchbox so that you can wait patiently. And when the other person comes into the car, you are not going to explode. Why? Because you've had your fruit while you wait. You've had your sandwich while you wait. You've been listening to music while you wait. You've also been chatting to somebody while you wait. You have allowed the person to be there and to be who they are. And if you are the one who is outgoing for heaven's sake don't force your quiet spouse to greet a million people they don't want to greet a million people they're not being nasty they're not being antisocial they just don't want to greet a million people they want to wave one wave and this wave should cover everybody look from this side to that side one two three they've greeted people three times so they're not going to make it intimate if you want to go and check how each one is and ch check how their parents were how their weeks were you do you do your stuff you go, they did the wave. You go do the whole reporter thing and take down notes, come back. When you meet in the car, you are satisfied because you greeted your million people. They are satisfied because they waved. And the wave is not unholy. Hi, happy sap. That's it. Why? Because it's not them to greet everybody. So the, the other, the, 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 when the two try to become one, it's either one is going to dissolve into the other or and become one person literally in terms of brains, ideas, everything, character. And you look at your friend, you're like, what happened? And they're like, yeah, hey, I got married. We're like, yo, okay. Or you can intentionally decide that you will remain two individuals who are just part of one unit. If you are married to someone who's loud, allow them to be loud. And if you feel the loudness is one of those things that make you shake your head, Shake your head, take a deep breath, and allow them to be loud. And if you are with somebody who is quite soft, shake your head and figure, oh, Lord, please, can we get a PA system to up the volume? But leave them. The idea that the two shall become one does not really mean the other one has to be dissolved into this one. They should remain two individuals who 
who are one unit. But I have observed that the risk that we always run when two people come together is that one of them may end up being swallowed up by the other. And when they are swallowed up by the other person, um, it can become unpleasant. Now, in dealing with people who've got the, the dynamics of being married, uh, they vary from, from different stages in our marriage. In, in our early years, um, we, we start out shortly after we get married and the major challenge we have is adjusting. And, and this is an adjustment that happens everywhere. It happens when you start a new job. It happens when you join a new church. It happened when you had siblings. It happens every, every time you come to a new environment, you adjust, this is who you are, this is how you do things, this is how the other person does things, and you are trying to find a way that works for both of you. This process of trying to adjust, this process of trying to make sure that, 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 that you, first of all, are, are able to share space together. Because remember, now that you're married, you're sharing a bedroom together. Uh, which means your, your cleanliness habits come into a play, come into play. One of you may be quite neat and the other one not so. And because you share the same space, it's the same bedroom. You, you, the, the, the other person's uh, lack of neatness is in your face. It's in your face. Sometimes you may even be sharing your, your ensuite bathroom and you find that the other person's lack of basic hygiene is in your face. It's not something you can decide, you know what, I'm not going to pay attention. It's in your face. The other person's comfort with making the bed in the evening before they get into it and not in the morning, it's in your face because you share a room. And because you share a house, you still have to figure out that this person thrives at night. They watch television until 2 a.m. and they sleep and you must be there and you enjoy the, no enjoy the noise and, and you must try and find a way in which they can do their late night thing and you can do your early thing. The process of adjustment is natural. We all try to find a way of adjusting to living with somebody else, and that is okay. And that process of adjustment is going to come with a lot of fights. It comes with a lot of fights. Why? Because usually we think that our normal is the other person's normal. So we fight. We fight over these things. And these battles are battles. Initially, you are trying to change your spouse and make them more like you, you are trying to change them to get them to think more like you, and it's fine. And sometimes, and sometimes we feel if they can just change this one little thing, because sometimes you may feel that my spouse is wonderful. Oh, oh my lord, oh, if you could just handle the issue of cleanliness, oh, oh, if you can just handle the issue of cleanliness, we could be fine. And so, you fight over the cleanliness because you're trying to get the person to improve, and they're not improving. They, they, they're not improving and you keep on fighting and, and usually when people say we fight a lot and i indicate to them no you're fighting because you are still trying to change the other one fight because you have energy to fight part of what needs to happen you need to run out of energy when you run out of energy to fight when you realize the fighting doesn't work that's when you are actually open to start making this thing work for as long as you still have energy you still feel that i i can tweak the person i can i can i can i can change this person i can i can just if they can only just do this they would be perfect <laughs> you are in for a high jump because generally people don't change because of pressure from their spouses. So the adjusting process, the process of adjusting to living with other person comes with a lot of fights and that's normal. Doesn't mean that, um, that, that, that there's something necessarily wrong in your marriage. In fact, most, most, you'll find that a number of couples who have fought trying to adjust to one another, at some point, at some point, it, it occurred, they wondered if they, they should have gotten married. I remember there was, there was a, a day we fought with Avia. We, 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 we were just newlyweds. We was probably within our first year of marriage. I mean, the fight was so big. It was one of those fights where you throw everything, everything, everything. And, and man, we went out. And, 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 then, and then we did not resolve the fight, of course. We fought, 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 fought. It was one of those fights that end with, fine, fine. All right. Then we, I remember at night, uh, I was sitting in the lounge. It was dark, it didn't turn on the light. I was sitting there on the floor. I don't know why sometimes when things are tough, you end up sitting on the floor instead of on the sofa, but that's a discussion for another day. So here I was sitting on the floor um, thinking, and then she comes and she joins me. And now we are having this discussion, calm as anything. We realize that men, we should not have gotten married. We, we do, we, we just realize that, Man, it was a big mistake. And fortunately, we did not have any kids. And then we are thinking, man, we should not have gotten married. 
maybe we should just get divorced because let's cut our losses. And we agreed, you know what? We should cut our losses, go our separate ways. And then I said to her, you go and file and I will sign. And she said, no, you file and I will sign. All right. It was in our first year of marriage, 2001, when we got married. I think we are still waiting for the other one to file and the other one is going to sign. But the point I'm making is we, we get to a point where you wonder, was this, thing, was this the right decision? I mean, the one is not changing. They're not improving. And someone would even say, I say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. For how long? It's been six months. It's been a year. It's been two. And people wonder, but how long? How long should I stick around? I mean, and, and then I say, no, you're busy adjusting. The person asks, how long does the whole adjusting thing last? Well, there's no time frame for adjusting. The adjusting thing depends on whether you are willing to accept that your spouse is not going to change. For as long as you think they are going to change, you are adjusting. You are going to fight trying to change them. The day you accept, the day you accept that your spouse's stinginess is not going anywhere and make peace with it. I'm married to a stingy person. Make peace with it. My spouse is stingy. The day you understand that my filthy spouse is not going anywhere, my beautiful piglet is here to stay, then you are ready to start building a marriage. But for as long as you feel this needs to be changed, that needs to be changed. <laughs> oh, we wish you all the best of luck. We, you, we, we, you, 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 are like, you are like someone who is driving at 40 Ks on the freeway and the other cars are passing and you're wondering why you are not getting there. Simply because you have not accelerated to the next gear. The next gear is accepting that this is the person I am married to. If you don't get to the point, you will spend a lot of time adjusting. And this is the interesting thing. There are couples who try to change one another for nine years and 10th year decide to go their separate ways. And they say, I've tried everything. And yet they're trying everything. They were trying to change the spouse. The success starts with you accepting that the person you married, that version you had just before you got married, yeah, that's probably the best version you are going to get. After you get married, it'll probably deteriorate a little bit and the Lord can probably bring it back up. But that's the version you're going to have. That's the version you married. That's the version you're going to have until Jesus comes again. Why? Simply because you married an adult. The process of raising this person up was done by the parents or grandparents, whoever raised this person. By the time you met them, they were full adult, complete they were old. And when you married them, they, they were completely, they were complete adults. The same way your changes are not going to come either. In fact, when generally we change as human beings, it's because the Holy Spirit has done a huge number on us. So those who don't want to accept that my spouse is not going to change, spend, can spend 12, 15, 20 years adjusting and praying and fasting. Oh Lord, when are you going to relieve me? Believe me, there are certain things that can change. Things like uh, my spouse drinks, um, things like my spouse may be reckless with money. That can change in terms of degrees, but spenders are spenders and savers are savers. Um, and, 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 and that's it. But, but first thing is, you don't expect your spouse to change. The, what you do is to say, how are we gonna make this work? Now, once you say, my spouse is not going to change, that's when you start saying, let me try and understand them. Once you say, let me try and understand them, you are trying to figure out a way of living happily with this person that's finding each other. And hopefully it happens at the same time. Because sometimes you'll find that one is trying to find the other, the other one is still trying to change you. <laughs> Problems. But once you decide, okay, fine. We're two adults that are most likely not going to change. How do we make this work? And then in the process of understanding and finding each other and realizing, oh, this one, when they have money, they usually look around for things to do with the money, which means we must, if we are going to save, there must be a debit order. If they get paid on the 24th, the debit order must run at midnight. Or if they get paid on the 25th, it must run at midnight or it must run on the 24th. So by the time the salary comes, there's already a big hole. Boom, the debit order comes in. Because once they see the money, 
they will find something. So you, you come up with mechanisms to deal with this person. Because remember, you, the other one is not, is not the simple, is not the simple, uh, is, it's not the only one who, who requires things to change. There are certain things that have to be done to deal with your issues as well. Remember, we said both of you are sinners. Both of you are sinners. So, so, so you, the process of saying, okay, this is how I can, I can be able to live with each other. This is how we're going to live with one another. This is how we are going to accommodate. If you have a problem with cleanliness and the other one simply does, could not care, maybe the solution, if you don't want to be the one cleaning, is to hire someone. Other than that, if you feel I'm not going to hire somebody, people, I'm, I'm married to an adult, hmm, you are going to be frustrated. You're going to end up in one of those institutions needing a week just to distress. So I would say, if it, the cleanliness issue bothers you, you either handle it yourself or get someone to do it. Why? Because this is what you have. This is what you've married to. Now the process of saying, okay, fine. I understand this is how we are going to do it. And you that's finding one another because you've already accepted that my spouse is here. This is the template I have. This is what I'm working with. Now, how do I work with it? In the process of doing that, you develop your own rhythm. You develop your own system of saying, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And this is how we take care of it. In fact, you'll find that you even get to realize that when this one is angry, this is the response that works with that anger. And they get to realize that when you are irritable, when, 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 when it's that time of the month and you have your own issues, they realize this is how you handle it. Initially, they may have thought of ignoring you and then they discover the ignoring thing does not work. Maybe I should say something and, and absorb a few nasty responses. And then of course, she's going to end up appreciating the fact that I tried, even though I did not succeed, but it's a thought that counts. Whatever the case may be, you eventually find your rhythm to say, okay, fine, in this situation, that's that's the goal. To be, okay, fine, this is, this is how we handle one another in our day-to-day -day life. That's developing your own rhythm. You, 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 this new rhythm is a rhythm that is a combination of things that you both like, trying to exclude the things you don't like, coming up with things that work for both of you. And the important thing is when things come up, resolve them. I say it because when people get divorced after 22 years and you ask what happened, they will always trace it to the early stages of their marriage. Some could trace it to just before they got married. When you say it was people who get divorced after 15 years or 20, I had a friend who got divorced after 32 years. And when I asked what was the problem, he went back to the first two years of the marriage. Someone gets, they decide the marriage is over. Like, what's the problem? They tell you about what happened on the wedding day. When things come up, you resolve them because when they are not resolved, it's not like they go away. They stay there and they keep on surfacing every time there's a fight. You find a way to resolve it. Now to resolve doesn't mean you come up with a, a resolution that's acceptable to both parties. You sit down, you talk about it. To ignore it doesn't work. To have a fight that ends up with fine, fine, whatever, whatever. That fight does not help anything. It expresses your anger. Afterwards, you must go back and find out, okay, what was the issue? How do we resolve it? It's important to resolve it so that it does not become a skeleton one day will come out and when the person says i've had enough they will pull things from 15 years ago and the other one is like yo i thought we were done with that thing and the other one said when you thought it was resolved what did you think was a resolution and the one's like no we just stopped talking about it. that's not resolving that's ignoring it and the process of the, the decision to resolve stuff includes a decision to have the courage to start uncomfortable conversations and decide that these uncomfortable conversations are not going to end up in a fight. They are not going to end up in one of those blowouts um, that, that we are not interested in. That these conversations are going to be uncomfortable, yes. However, they are going to be fruitful for us. As we go on after the initial years, we found... Now, the reason I've said the early years and the later years is because it varies. For some people, those early years last for three years, some for five, some for seven, some for nine, some for 15, some for 20. Why? Because it's not about the number of years. It's about what you, the, number, the, the, the ground you've been able to cover, the progress you've been able to make. That's it. Is that... We can be preoccupied with the nuts and bolts of building a life together. We can be preoccupied with the nuts and bolts of building a life together. These are, these nuts and bolts that I'm talking about, um, are, they have to do with waking up in, 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 in the morning and going to work 
or running your, your, your businesses. Now, these things require energy, they require time, they require focus. Sometimes you bring homework with you. And, and in all of that, you both are aware that the goal is this, we are building this together. But you, you, can, you can so be involved in the nuts and bolts of building life together that you forget to be a couple, that you become, you become evangelists together, you be, which is a good thing. You become financers of your dreams. Um, you, you can have a situation where parenting overtakes the marriage, where you, 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 you spend your time and effort and money on parenting, and that becomes the primary responsibility. And you forget how to be a couple. It doesn't mean you don't know how to look like a couple. You forgot how to be a couple. You, you forgot how to spend time together, how to spoil one another, how to do things just for the two of you, such that every time you think of going out, you, you have the kids have to come along. To do what? The kids don't have to come along all the time. Why? Because these kids are going to leave. When they leave, you're going to be stuck with somebody and you're not quite sure how to be happy with this person. And so the nuts and bolts of building this life together, the, 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 the parenting, all of these can take over your marriage to an extent where you become efficient in running a household, efficient at raising children, but you no longer know how to be a couple. Even your conversations are about the nuts and bolts of the life you're building together or about parenting. They're not really about you. Your plans, when you think holidays, your holiday is about you and your spouse and your children. And it's in situations like these that holidays end up being the entire family going to visit another family member or going to the rural areas to meet the whole family. And you spend the entire holiday period with other people. Your, your wife is being babysat by other wives. Your husband is being babysat by other husbands. Your children are being babysat with other children. That's not quality time. You meet each other in the evening when you are coming to sleep. You are both exhausted. You are tired. If you're going to do anything, 45 seconds will attend to it and you go to sleep. Now, when, when this happens, the relationship between the two can, can, can imperceptibly grow cold. You can grow apart. And this is one of the things that threaten marriages when kids leave. And, and you, find, uh, you find psychologists talk about an empty nest syndrome. They talk about how it can mess up a couple when the kids leave. Why does it mess you up? Because for the bulk of your marriage, you were parents, not really husband and wife. You were not a couple. You were a team that was raising children. There's nothing wrong in being parents. But that has to, that has to, that, 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 that cannot take the place of you being a couple. You, you must make your own plans. You must make, you must have your own life that is appealing to you, which means that you must intentionally decide not to stop being a couple. The kids must know that on certain days, it's just the two of you, you are leaving. Why you're going to town? Why you're going to a restaurant? Why? Because you are married. That's it. There was, there was a time, and, and you must find different ways of having fun. I, I remember we, we, there was a time we, we enjoyed a date night with we different types of date nights. But this one particular date night uh, program we had, we, we, we registered for ballroom classes. Um, we were living in Somerset West. We registered for ballroom class and we decided, let's give it a shot. And so for our date night, we would go for these ballroom lessons and my wife, we would dance. It was, we learned Latin American dances and ballroom dances. We were enjoying ours. And the kids would ask, where are we going? We say, we're going dance. It's, we, we, told them, we are married and married people can go and have fun. It's our date night. And we would go and we would dance and it was nice. And, and funny enough, I, I made it a point that I did not have meetings on those days. The only times those date nights were messed up by weeks of prayer or evangelistic campaigns. But other than that, we had fun. We did, this is what we did. Different things you do for your own date nights, but don't forget how to be a couple. We found a restaurant. At some point, we found a restaurant and we've made it a point that when we're, where we travel, we find a place that we like. We found a restaurant that we enjoyed. We tried the different dishes. We found the one that we like to a point where we would go to this restaurant and they would know, okay, fine, this is what we are going to order because that's why we went there. You, you, you don't forget to be a couple. Find something you're going to do together. And I've admired people who've decided to run together. Now, 
some you may sometimes you may find that one starts running and the other one joins them. Others cycle together. Others are selling forever. Forget. I'm not trying to promote forever. I'm just saying others are selling forever or have a life, whatever they're doing. Find something to do together because that thing that you are doing together keeps you a couple. If you decide you're going to sing together, that's fine. Be that duet that sings together. Now, it doesn't count when you actually going to say we're going to sing in a choir. Whoa, there are many other people in that choir. But find something that you do together, something that you as a couple will be able to do. Even when the kids have left, this is still going to be your life. You are still going to enjoy. You're still going to be able to connect. Do you like traveling? Do it together. Have your own maps. Have your own scrapbooks where you, you talk about different experiences that you have and share them. Find something you do as a couple. Why? If you don't do that, the nuts and bolts of building your life together and parenting will overtake your marriage and you will cease to be a couple. You'll just be people who are able to run an efficient household and raise children. There is more to life than these things. Why? Because there is a time when they will not be the primary focus of your life. There will be a time when you've put systems in place, you've paid for things, the nuts and bolts of building a life together will be there. It will be on autopilot. Your kids will be gone. They'll come back to visit and they'll come back for emergencies. What, when that happens, you still need to have your life together. So don't be overtaken by your job. Don't be overtaken by parenting. Make sure that you make space for yourself as a couple. You must still be able to be in love with one another. You must still be able to be excited by the time you spend together. If you don't invest in it, it's going to catch up on you. Now, as you do this as a couple, this is a text I want us to, 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 to leave with tonight. It's found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And in this text, Paul says, let us consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Of course, it goes on to talk about how we should not forsake the gathering of, 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 of saints that other people have, have done so. Um, that's, that, that's what he's encouraging. Now, imagine as you spend time together, as you choose to build this life together as a couple, remember, part of the excitement and the joy that, that comes with the success of the couple comes from the fact that you found ways to encourage one another, to spur. I like the King James Version. Instead of saying spur, it says to provoke. It says to provoke one another to love. Now, it may take a while before you find the right buttons to push to get the other person to get into love, to get the other person to do good deeds. Some people don't do good deeds unless they have received good deeds first. So you'll find that sometimes you may be married to somebody who needs you to do something for them to reciprocate. Sometimes you'll find that you're married to somebody who needs to see you running with something and then they join you. They and it does not always work to criticize and attack. Sometimes you may say, but I've tried this and that and this and that. When are you not wanting to try, you know, you're not wanting to try anything. You just always bored and you know, you're making the whole marriage boring. Mm -mm. It simply means you have not found, you have not found what works with them. Let us consider how we can spur, how we can provoke one another to love and to good deeds, which means if doing if you are if you are going to come back and put clothes in the washing machine and i come back and i put the clothes in the washing machine and you walk in and you smile and you feel thanks for doing that and that is going to make you do something for me in return you have found one way to provoke good deeds from the other person. You have found one way of provoking love from the other person. So you will end up doing things for one another, with one another, to try and get the other one to express love. The other one to, you are trying to bring it out through your own deeds. You are trying to get the other person to do good deeds for yourself, for herself, for himself, just generally. Find ways consider those ways is what the Bible is saying. And you'll find that the different challenges that we face, the different dynamics that come with marriage can be handled. If sometimes a couple beautiful ways of coexisting. 
irreconcilable differences. We found these joyful ways of existing with these irreconcilable differences. But our parting note is this, consider these ways. Consider these ways of sparing one another, provoking one another to love and to good works. And you will be able to navigate the dynamics of marriages in the different stages of it. May God richly bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mfundisi. Thank you once again. The Lord used you in a very, very, I, I, can, I cannot even words fail me. You know, and uh, as you were presenting, I actually said to myself, maybe I would, I would also try taking my wife for a ballroom dance. We'll, we'll try that one. <laughs> Man, I enjoyed that. Oh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, that, that was good. But without any waste of time, Funis, I don't want to take a lot from out of your presentation. There are quite a number of questions, and I want us to quickly go to those questions and see if we can't answer right. them. Yes, I will start by this one. How long does it, um, how long does adjusting take, Fundisi? And maybe you can okay, answer that. Just... Sorry, mm -hmm. maybe you can answer that together with this one. They're almost the same. So Mfundis, adjusting right. is simply, in simple terms, means accepting things as they are. How long does it take to adjust? And does, does that mean you take things as they are? All right. <clears throat> Uh, the adjusting has no time frame to it. It depends on, on, on when you get to a point of accepting. Acceptance is accepting that, that, that this is your spouse's uh, personality. Uh, this is the character that you have. And, and more often than not, you will find that this person you married is not surprising you um, in, in the sense that they are being a completely different person than they were before. Of course, there are things you are discovering now because you live with them. But this is how they've always been. Um, and so, and, and the chances of them just changing now after slim close to nil, the Holy Spirit usually does that. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit is patient, even with us. He has taken many, many years to change us. So it, it depends how long it takes for you to say, my spouse, I met them as an adult, they're not going to change. Let me accept that this is my spouse. Now, the second question is, and, and it can range. It could be two years, three years, five years, seven years, 15, 20 years, depends. The second question is, does it mean accepting things the way they are? Now, accepting things the way they are and accepting that your spouse, is, this, is, this is how my spouse is, are two completely different things. There, there, are, certain, there are certain things that, that happen in the marriage uh, that have to do with morality, simple, clean, right and wrong, sinful stuff. That stuff, people can change and the Holy Spirit is in the business of changing that. We we'll work on that. But the, the fact that your, your, your spouse is a spender, that stuff is not going anywhere. They're not gonna change. If, if, your, if your spouse has not picked up uh, cleanliness habits by the time you met them and married them, <laughs> just get someone to help with the cleaning. So there are things that are not going to change because they should have been dealt with in childhood. But there are things that have to do with a sinful lifestyle that the Lord can step in and change. So, so if you're married to an abuser, that person either needs therapy or there's a big problem that has to be dealt with. If you're married with someone who is promiscuous, that person needs the intervention from the Lord. They might even need some form of therapy, but they need intervention from the Lord. But, but you'll find that generally we, we, when we talk about the adjustment with the spouses, it's those things you feel, if only they can just do this, they'll be perfect, wonderful. Just this little thing. There's no little thing. It's a big thing, big thing. So that's my response to those two questions. Thank you, Mfundisi. How do you resolve issues if there is no communication? You can't. You need to find a way to, to communicate. And, 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 and sometimes you ask, why, why is there no communication? Um, <clears throat> and sometimes the reason why there is no communication is because the, the, the conversations end, out, end up being nuclear wars in the sense that we start a conversation and right in the middle of the conversation, we start throwing not just regular bombs, nuclear bombs. Why? Because you say things that you cannot unsay that are going to cause the kind of hurt that, you, that is difficult to recover from. You sometimes use things that we were told in confidence, in 
in tender moments, we throw it back at the other person's face. You know what happens in those instances? You're trying to say to the spouse, you, you are not someone to be trusted with sensitive information because you can throw it back at their face. So without communication, you can't resolve it. You have to find a way in which you can have the communication. And if you are trying to cultivate communication, don't try and blame the other person. Don't try and attack them. Don't try and be better to say, I'm trying to talk, you're not cooperating. That's an attack. If the person, if, if you are going to try and initiate a talk and the other person is hostile, because you are trying to establish the communication, don't respond to the hostility. The focus is that you want to open up lines of communication, open up lines of communication. Without communication, you can't resolve things. And if there's currently no result communication in your marriage, you might need the assistance of a third person because without communication, you can't resolve it. You can pray, you can fast, the Lord will keep you alive, he will give you strength, but you can't resolve the issue without communication. Thank you, Mfundisi, for answering that one. Great lesson, Pastor, but what happens when a couple is just not compatible? Try different things, but nothing works out, and one partner ends up bored in a relationship. These people are not compatible. What happens? Um, the, the issue of compatibility sometimes is, 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 is because we want our spouses to be like us. And where they're not like us, when they don't like the things we like, we feel we are incompatible. Let me give an example. You, you, you could be an outgoing person who likes to attend events. You want to attend weddings. You want to attend showers. You want to attend different activities that are there. I mean, there's a nap kind of person that you are. You are a people's person. You host people in your home. You go to visit people in their homes. That's the kind of person you are. You are with a spouse who is not interested in all of that. In fact, tells you, you go. I mean, I'm going to stay here. Now, it does not mean these two people are incompatible. The problem is sometimes they would say they are incompatible because you want your spouse to come along, to tag along with you when you are doing the whole social thing. And they're, they're just not interested. And you don't understand why they can't they come? Why can't they make the effort? I'll tell you why they can't they make the effort. It is because small talk takes up a lot of energy. You need a lot of energy to do small talk, a lot of energy, a lot of energy. You need to think, you need to pay attention, you need to listen, you need to laugh. You need to smile, you need to giggle. It takes a lot of energy. And the person is, not just, is just not into it. So sometimes it's not because the people are incompatible. It's because we want our spouses to be like us. And I would say to those people, consider allowing your spouse to be what they are and you be what you are. I'll consider creating space for them to enjoy what they enjoy and for you to enjoy what you enjoy. Very interesting thing I once remember, I remember once I was in the presence of the Papus and Mrs. Papu was saying, ah, he runs, I don't run. That's it. They've created space in that marriage for him to do his marathons and his cycling. She's not running. She's not cycling. And that's fine. Doesn't mean that they're incompatible. It simply means she's not going to run. She's not going to cycle. He's going to do that. They'll do other things together. But these things that are exciting to him, these particular things, they are not her things. And that's sometimes what we need to do in our marriages. Create space for the other person to find the things that excite them. Once they return from those things that excite them and you've created the space and there's not going to be a fight when they come back, you will find that we are now, both of us in a wonderful mood, are able to spend time together and be more accommodative. Thank you, Fundisi. The last one for tonight. And uh, thank you, friends, for staying with us. Uh, but we'll do the last one for tonight. Trying to bring it out, you try it all and nothing comes out. It's just dry land full of condescending and criticism all the time. How does one deal with such situation? You are going to need assistance in dealing with the cause because people don't start out that way. You did not start out that way. If you started out that way, you would not have gotten married. The reason why you got, you got married is because you did not have dry land at the beginning. You did not have... Uh, uh, so much condescension at the beginning. There was not the much the, the kind of criticism you have now at the beginning. In other words, things were said and done between the beginning and now. And they may not have been a big deal to you, or you may have thought that you've gone beyond them. But the things that have happened and the impact of these things that have happened are such that now this is what you have. You may need a third person. I would advise a therapist or advise a professional that you are going to sit with so that you can deal with the causes of why you have what you have now. 
I know it was not always like this because if it was always like this, the two of you would not have got it. That would be my advice. Thank you, Mfundis, once again. And I think it would be appropriate to pray for our families tonight. Thank you, over to you, Mfundisi. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving heavenly parent, we thank you, Lord, for the love that you've loved us with. We thank you for the gift of marriage and the gift of family. We thank you for love. We thank you for joy. We thank you for companionship. We thank you for intimacy. We thank you for all the beautiful and wonderful things we can get out of marriage. I pray, Father, that you may bless the families that are represented here in the screens tonight. Bless them with the presence of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you may grant them peace in their lives. I pray, Father, that you may give each and every one of our families the wisdom to seek help when we need help. I pray, Father, that you may transform our hearts, make us more like you, make us what you want us to become so that we can be a pleasure to live with. I pray, Father, that you may make it each one's business for us to make it easier for our spouses to be married to us and to live with us. I pray that, Father, we may find ways of provoking one another to love and to good works. Where there is conflict, I pray, Father, that you may bring peace. If the two can find it together, give them the courage and the wisdom to seek a third party. I pray, Father, that where there are financial problems, you may find ways of guiding them out of those financial problems. I pray, Father, where there are other issues of health, quality of relationships, that you may step in. Where there are no relationship skills, lead them to places or people or to resources that will help them develop those relationship skills. And where there is no communication, Father, I pray that you may melt the hearts so that we can initiate that process that leads us to a path of resolving matters and making our marriages worthwhile. worthwhile. Father, I pray that where there is abuse, you may intervene and bring it to an end. And where someone is not willing to change from the abusive lifestyle, I pray that you may give the other one the courage to respond in a way that preserves their life, that preserves their relationship with you. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank you, friends, for joining us tonight. Let's meet again tomorrow night, same time, same place. Blessings to you. Keep safe. Good night.